Okay, what we what we don't want this to be is the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper doing fun with flags. Oh, why not? Because this is professional. We're, 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 we've got, we're better than that. But I made a flag. Oh, God. I made your flag. Okay, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I see what you've done there. Yeah, but like if that. you don't really want flags, how about fun with maps? Oh, this could be a whole series. Yeah. Okay, anyway, on with today's video. So, if you pick up any modern atlas, and obviously we don't all use atlases these days, road atlases, we tend to use sat nav, but same principle, everything on it is precise. It gets you from A to B, it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's perfect, it's to scale. But it wasn't always quite like that, was it? No, so going back to a time before modern transportation, trains, planes and automobiles, <laughs> going back before modern transportation, maps often, diff often served a different purpose altogether. Now this is the story of a 70 year old map maker who in the latter part of his life managed to map 26,000 miles of roads. And not entirely for the purposes that you would think. Before the 1500s, there were a good few maps about of the British Isles. But they all had one thing in common. They were barely recognisable. Varying shapes and sizes, you would do well to even guess that they were supposed to represent the British Isles. Over the centuries, map makers didn't always concentrate on the roads themselves. No, so they would map a lot of features. They would map hills, wooded areas, and the towns themselves, and often rivers. But they would very rarely concentrate on the routes themselves. Often they were um, old pilgrimage routes and things like that, but nothing that would give you a sense of scale or distance from the next town. There was nothing to guide you between the two towns other than these prominent features. In steps John Ogilby, a rather unique character. Born in Scotland in 1600, he lived a rather charmed life. A dancer in his very early years, he then went on to set up Ireland's first theatre, the Werber Street Theatre. After the Irish Rebellion, he returned to England, where he learnt Latin and Greek. He offered translation services, earning him some good sums of money, after which he soon married and then set up his publishing business. After a period of time, he earned the favour of Charles II, helping him with arrangements for the coronation in 1660. It wasn't until the majority of his work was destroyed in the Great Fire of London, he turned to surveying. And he was appointed the King's Cosmographer and Geographical Printer. It's quite a mouthful. I'm pretty sure that here that his connections that he developed over the years will play a significant part in this story. At the age of 70, Ogilvy's most notable work began. He was given a royal commission to survey the whole of England and Wales. Perhaps a little odd that a person holding a position as Master of Revels in Ireland and a publisher would be given such an undertaking. Ogilvy undertook the task in a completely unique way. Have a look at these maps of Winchester, which all predate any of Ogilby's maps. You'll notice that not one contains a road or trackway. Ogilby, however, really set the stage for modern map making. Prior to this, Winchester had never been mapped in such detail. It very much was a continuation of the modern mapping of London that he undertook soon after the Great Fire of London. Ogilby's maps weren't like the modern day ones, they were more of a sheet. So instead of an area, it was actually a location to a location, A to B, in separate sheets. This was completely unique. So this is a route. And what's more important, it had scale. This route and all these routes were done to one inch to one mile. This was completely revolutionary. The first clue, however, that something wasn't quite right with these maps was the very first sheet. And when I say not quite right, I don't mean in their unique and groundbreaking quality. I mean their actual purpose. The first sheet contains the route London to Aberystwyth. Now, at the time, Aberystwyth was a town with less than 100 homes. This was odd. Many other routes could also be seen in the same light, often leading to obscure places or routes in areas that were considered potentially dangerous. Take a look at the curious Hollyhead route. You have to wait until the tide goes out to go around this mountain. The book even read... So here, your sacred majesty, I present you an important novelty, the scale of peace in war. That doesn't sound like an atlas. It doesn't sound like an atlas. But then, I mean, these atlases weren't how we would know an atlas these days. 
They're not for the everyday traveller. It seems not, although the everyday traveller could certainly use it. Yeah, but not to everywhere else where we do these days. So where was the money in it? Well, Ogilvy realised that this could be tied in with Charles II's uh, postal town project in his, his, his set up. He set this up between 1660 and 1667. And Ogilvy realised that this could be tied in with that, linking the postal towns. Um, Charles II had realised what an important revenue this had become for the crown. So, in Ogilby offering an image of London's relationship with the rest of England, it dramatically aided Charles II and his control of the country in more ways than one. All postal towns would now be linked via this new revolutionary map. Ogilby realised it was going to be quite difficult for him to raise the funds to do all this. So, he actually embarked on what was kind of classed as the first ever kind of crowdfunding. Absolutely. So he did get a little bit of money from the uh, the Crown, but certainly not enough to map 26,000 miles. So he wrote to a number of um, VIPs, I guess we would call them, and he wrote, and I shall read, For ease of such of the gentry, as a far remote from the author's dwelling. So I guess what that means is, for the VIPs all around the country, this was going to be a massive benefit to them, um, and help them bring in their bit of land closer together. Um, so, yeah, and what an ingenious way of securing funds. And also, King Charles had been criticised quite a lot for knowing the whole world a lot better than he knew his own country. So, yeah, this would help him um, bring the country closer together and therefore easier to control. Right, I've waffled enough about this wonderful piece of art, basically. Yep. Um, let's see if we can map this in a weird and wonderful time lapse. Here's an exceptionally scaled map of uh, England and Wales, a um, little bit of Northern Ireland too. Um, and let's see if we can use Ogilby's map and draw some of his routes just to see exactly where they did go. Okay, so, um, I don't know what that really tells you. <laughs> obviously, there was a heck of a lot that came out of London for obvious reasons, um, and obviously the other major postal towns along the way. Um, we'll put up a list. You can have a look on Wikipedia and see the John Ogilby's list and have a look at some of these maps yourself. Absolutely fascinating. Um, so, from the two of us, hope you've enjoyed um, our little map. Uh, fun with maps. Fun with maps! <laughs> <laughs> and um, the story of the first, uh, the very first road atlas. Go and have a look online. It's absolutely fascinating. And we'll see you next week. It's to scale. Oh God. <laughs> With an important novelty, the scale of peace and war.